The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V and pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. Good evening, Tom. First question, Father, concerning Pope John Paul I. Although he was a Vatican II Pope, he was generally, generally regarded as a devout believer in Jesus Christ and the <coughs> Virgin Mary. Does Father Jenkins believe there is any credibility to the rumors that John Paul was murdered because he intended to reform the Vatican, beginning with its bank? Well, that's a, a good, straightforward question from a, uh, from a viewer here. And do I believe there is reason to, uh, to believe that he is murdered? And the answer is yes, I do. I, I think there is reason to believe that he was murdered, and uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the story that is out there, and uh, authors such as David Yallop and others who have written on the subject, <clears throat> uh, say that he was actually relatively conservative. Well, you know, he's the first pope in history to take two names, John Paul, and the two names he took were in reverence to the Novus Ordo, uh, the, the popes of the Novus Ordo before him, right? John Paul VI and and uh, John the Twenty Third. So I think by choosing those names as to who his his mentors and who his leading leading lights were, that we couldn't have expected a great return to Catholic tradition from him. However, it is said that uh, no sooner was he elected to succeed Paul the Sixth, but that he uh, discovered the depths of the Vatican Bank scandal the money laundering scandal involving the, the Vatican Bank <clears throat> for, for public and pious works of, of, the, of the Church, and the Branco, uh, Banco Ambrosiano of Italy, and also the Masonic Lodges of Italy, the P2, all in collusion <clears throat> to launder bad money, dirty money. Uh, this uh, was such a horrific scandal that it wound up with uh, uh, Roberto Calvi uh, hung, hanging by the neck from, uh, who was uh, involved deeply in the banks there, hanging by the neck with his pockets full of uh, coins or something, uh, from Blackfriars Bridge in London, of all places, and uh, Michael Sindono being uh, put to death in prison, they say, I understand, poisoned to death. And uh, this was a huge scandal. It involved a, a Catholic archbishop from Chicago, Maracinkus, uh, who actually had an arrest warrant out for him in Italy, so he had to be airlifted out of the Vatican to get, out of the, get away from the authorities there. That's how scandalous this whole thing was. This is what the, this is what, uh, the Novus Ordo is. This is what modernism does. It creates scandals. <clears throat> and... Um, but, you see, that, the, the, the actual scandal hadn't broken yet. The story is that uh, John Paul I discovered this. He was, uh, uh, what was it, Luci Luciano Al Al uh, Albigioni or something like that. I'm sorry, I'm having a little brain lapse there. I'll have to ask Jorge, he would know. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that uh, he seems to have discovered what was brewing there. And he summoned the Secretary of State at the time. Time, his name was uh, Cardinal Vio, V I L L O T, and told him, "You're fired." You remember the the uh, parable our Lord told about the the householder who discovered that the uh, um, his right hand man there was uh, his steward, chief steward was embezzling, was was uh, wasting his goods, and he called him in and said, "Make give an accounting." You cannot be steward any longer. <clears throat> well, he, his expedient was to call people in and get them in his debt as partners of his crime. <clears throat> but the story that is told about uh, 
uh, John Paul I was that he was murdered. Uh, the story is that it was digitalis poison, he was murdered in the papal apartments, and uh, that he was discovered in such a way that the press did not actually report. Okay, it was covered over. And I understand there was no autopsy done for his sake, and I don't know what it would have done anyway with, with digitalis. But anyway, <clears throat> it just so happens that uh, among our traditional Catholics, we had a, a very fine, and I would actually say venerable lady, a convert, <clears throat> who was in uh, Rome at the time with her husband, and they had transactions with the Vatican. And within the Vatican, and uh, they also had friends who lived in Vatican City and actually worked in Vatican City. And for what it's worth, I'll tell you what she told me. And because of the dignity and the uh, just the, the even and truthful temperament of this woman, I, I actually believe this is true to this day. Uh, she's deceased now, God rest her soul. But she told me <clears throat> that uh, shortly after uh, John Paul I was found dead, uh, they were visiting their friends in Vatican City. And the gentleman said that he awakened the morning of John Paul I's death to hear a tremendous rush of people <clears throat> uh, storming by. It would be easy to do on this, the cobblestones, you know, that, that formed the pavement there. <clears throat> and he actually came out of his apartment and uh, joined, joined the crowd that was rushing. They were the, uh, the uh, Vatican uh, police and so on. He, and he actually ran with them up through the people's apartments and actually came to the room in which John Paul, the first body, lie, lie, lay there. He said he, that he was found there sprawled out on the floor, quite purple and quite contorted. And uh, as soon as they overcame their shock and noticed his presence there, they hustled him right out of the room. But it wasn't just uh, a fact that uh, John Paul I just sort of passed away quietly in his sleep in bed. Uh, not at all. So uh, there, there was something going on there. And by the way, I think what also makes it very credible that John Paul I was murdered because of the uh, chicanery going on and levels in the Vatican. Uh, <clears throat> the murders that have been publicly uh, reported since then. High level uh, Swiss guards dying suddenly, murdered, right? Right in the Vatican. And uh, the fact that they found in the apartment where the body was found more than one glass, uh, drinking glass, and apparently there were, more, there were other people present there, but they weren't there when the body was found. Who were they and where are they? That's the question. And they found uh, uh, leaks of Vatican information, uh, secret Vatican information that came out through uh, uh, the Novus Ordo Pope's own, uh, own uh, like right-hand man or, or confidant, right? Uh, I forget what, what post he actually held officially. <coughs> and here he was in, imprisoned in the, in the Vatican for a while <coughs> for having passed that information to the outside world. Uh, to journalists in the outside world. There's so much ferment going on there right now and uh, at, at all levels in the Vatican. And it's just, it's just worse, manifold worse under Francis. The intrigue and the, uh, the, the double uh, behind the scenes dealings, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, shortly after John Paul I died, all of this hit, all of this hit the press about the, the, um, the, 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 the Vatican Bank scandal. People can look that up, check it out, read what it was about. And uh, it might have been the occasion of the death of John Paul I, I happen to think that in fact it was. Now, Father, there's another theory going around considering this whole ordeal, and I, I recently encountered this in a, a documentary where they uh, they suggest that perhaps it could have been traditionalists that, if, that, that worked this murder because of the... Um, the, I guess the radical nature of, of John Paul I and how he wanted to uh, kind of give his stamp of approval to contraception and birth control and these new age ideas that were coming about. And so it was actually the traditionalist that wanted to prevent that from happening and it was traditionalists that, uh, that, that made all of this happen and that caused him to be murdered. 
I'm a Jew. That is a new one on me. Yeah. And you know what? That's the most absurd, ridiculous <laughs> thing that I've I've heard. They're they're really desperate, aren't they? Yeah. Really desperate. Yeah. You know, it, it, that is akin. That is sort of on the level they have. Of Nero blaming the burning of Rome, uh, of, of old Rome, on the Christians, <laughs> right? Uh, you know the the story about Nero fiddling while Rome burned. Yeah. I mean, it's it's well known that he torched Rome because he wanted to clear out the 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 masses. He burned out a square mile of the, the heart of old Rome <clears throat> in order to build his Domus Aurea for himself, his golden house. Right? He relocated all these. People who were not killed, but now were homeless. He relocated them out toward what is where the Vatican is now, intense city out there. And in order to cover his tracks, because the people were begin to uh, beginning to uh, catch on as to what happened, he blamed it on the Christians, and they were, of course, easy targets back then, <clears throat> and still are in many places. But this this story, I will give them. A, a, a Z minus for truthfulness and an A plus for inventiveness uh, and, and sure uh, I mean if one were to have a contest to see who could come up with the most fantastic absurd story I, I'd say these people would probably win okay. anyway what do you think of that story uh, I agree <laughs> with you <laughs> sounds, sounds pretty good oh boy uh, okay well Father let's move on to another question here, another email that we received from our viewers. What does the church teach about first cousin marriage? May one marry one's first cousin in the Catholic Church? From what I understand, because it goes against ecclesiastical law, but not divine law, a dispensation from a bishop can be obtained, as was the case in many historical circumstances with the royal families of Europe, etc. In our time, in this crisis in the church, from whom would we obtain the dispensation? In the first place, would the church grant this type of dispensation in this day and age? <clears throat> to my knowledge, no. I don't have any exceptions to that. Okay. Honestly. Um, uh, granted by the church, first cousins to marry. Um, nothing comes to mind. and uh, uh, That doesn't mean it's never happened. But I can't see such a... Personally, I, I don't know of any such dispensation granted. Certainly not a, to that close degree of kinship. Anyway, uh, it's common in Islam. Um, somebody even suggested this might explain some of the uh, the problems in, let's say, the Islamic temperament toward violence. <clears throat> but uh, uh, and not I, but some uh, actual card-carrying bona fide psychiatrist and and I think a psychologist have actually expressed that wonderment. Why is there such such a a proclivity toward violence, and this is one of the answers that they suggested. <clears throat> but in in the Catholic Church, uh, to my knowledge, that is that has always been prohibited. <clears throat> Would it be possible for the Church to grant some kind of dispensation in this day and age when when it's so hard for Catholics to find suitable? I don't think I don't know that. You know, there are certain uh, impediments that are ecclesiastical. And uh, that are uh, given by the church, and the church can dispense from those. But there are certain impediments that are laid down by divine law, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, the church cannot dispense from those. So, I mean, I could be wrong, and maybe our reader who says that there are examples of this would enlighten us both, maybe in, in giving us an account of some of them. I'd appreciate it if he would. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I personally, just right now, don't know of any. Now, after the program, I would think, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, uh, there was this and there was that. But right now, I can't think of any. And I, at least none come to mind. And uh, I would be, frankly, all I can say is I'd be very surprised to find that the church not only would, but even could grant such a dispensation. Um, but, uh, but I could be wrong on that. I'll, I'll have to double check on that. Okay. You know, Father, a, a related question, which uh, traditional Catholics face a lot, I actually had someone recently address this to me, is what about the, uh, the differences in marriage practices in the Old Testament? Uh, for, for example, you have uh, 
Jacob marrying uh, his his uh, he he married uh, Leah first, I believe it was, and then Rachel after that, and then he had uh, he also bore children with with several different handmaids and and servants. And so, what why why is it that this polygamy and and uh, plurality of wives was granted in the Old Testament, but today that that's prohibited? Why is there a difference in marriage laws in the Old Testament? Versus well, the, I believe it, the fathers explained that after the flood and the devastation of the human race, decimation of the human race, even more decimation, um, that God allowed for the sake of this, the primary purpose of relations, that is, giving life, he allowed a derogation from the secondary purpose, which is the unicity of the uh, of the bond, <clears throat> meaning that he could allow uh, a man to have uh, relations with women for the sake of repopulating the earth. Now you couldn't do that, and I couldn't do that, but God could, if He so chose, because we know that the primary essential purpose of marriage and marital relations is the sake of giving life. Mm -hmm something that the modern world doesn't want to hear and won't accept, but uh, it is a fact. That's God's purpose. The secondary essential purpose is the mutual support and care of the husband and wife for each other, uh, or the, the, the fidelity to each other. Right? Um, could God actually derogate from the secondary cause for the sake of promoting the primary purpose, uh, that is, of giving life and repopulating the earth? The fathers of the church admit so that he could do so. In fact, he did so. Was there a watershed, <clears throat> of Father, when 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 God said, "Up to this point, it's been acceptable to to do this, but from here on out, it's not acceptable anymore"? Was there a specific time when when our Lord said that, or how did the human race know that this that this practice is no longer acceptable? Well, in the time of Moses, of course, the Ten Commandments, there was a, I guess you might say, a, a tighten, <laughs> tightening up. <laughs> of the rules, as they have been known from the time of the fathers, uh, the patriarchs, to the time of Moses. Even then, there was a certain latitude, but nonetheless, I mean, God made it very clear uh, through the Decalogue and also in, in what followed. Um, for example, the slaying of 23,000 because of their fornication in the desert. Um, <clears throat> that he was not going to allow that or tolerate that any longer. We shouldn't really be surprised at that, though, because God could actually tolerate things uh, that are evil, because that's what toleration means. You tolerate something that is evil. Right? Very definition of toleration. And we know for a fact that God did tolerate, according to the Mo Mosaic Law, a men putting away their wives and taking other wives. He tolerated divorce. Not that he uh, condoned it, but he tolerated it. When our Lord came, <clears throat> he completely banned it. Uh, when he was confronted with the question of whether a man could put away his wife and take another, our Lord said, no. And when it was objected, well, Moses said we could, our Lord said, Moses uh, basically tolerated this because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not that way in the beginning, and it's not going to be that way from now on. And our Lord made it very clear. He said, a man who puts away his wife and takes another commits adultery. And the woman who takes another husband commits adultery. He was very emphatic about it. This is one of the reasons why, Tom, the, the, uh, the, the, these people hated him. Because he was actually accusing those who had been doing this, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and so on. He was accusing them of being adulterers. He was accusing them of actually committing adultery. Well, they were, they were the ones who sat in judgment and killed the adulterers. If they caught an adulteress, they, they would kill her. They, were, they tried to. Once they brought an adulteress to him and said, Moses said she should die. What do you say? And then our Lord now is here telling them that they actually also were, were doing what is really adultery. And he, he banned them. He forbade them to do it. They hated him for that. As you recall, even the apostles later afterwards came to our Lord and asked him, how can this be? It was just taken for granted. Uh, but uh, some people have a hard, have a hard uh, time understanding 
how this could be <clears throat> that uh, in the law of Moses and even in the Ten Commandments as uh, they were brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses the last commandment was and you can look this up in Exodus chapter 20 the last commandment was thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house semicolon neither shalt thou desire his wife nor his ox nor his ass nor his, nor his maid his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that belongs to him. So not only did the wife not come first, the house came first, the wife was listed, but she was listed with the slaves and with the livestock. Now one would read that today and say, my goodness, you know, this can't be, this isn't God's uh, desire, this isn't God's way of looking at the woman, right? He, he created the woman to be the companion and the helpmate and the supporter of men, right? And uh, flesh of his flesh and blood of his blood, right? And uh, now in the Ten Commandments brought down by Moses, she's listed with the ox and the donkey and the slaves. Well, people have to understand that God did not condone this. <clears throat> but, and he was going to change it. But he himself would change it in person as the second person of the Blessed Trinity made man, he would come personally to change that and give the command. But he was also willing to pay the price of the wrath of those who would not accept it. He wasn't going to put Moses in the position of having to confront the people with that because they would not have accepted it. There are a number of things that our Lord, uh, that God did in the Old Testament that were steps in the direction that's why at this, in the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord himself says, <clears throat> it was said to you of old, but now I say to you this. It was said to you of old, but now I say it of this. And our Lord wasn't saying the old law was defective. What he was saying was it was not perfect. And I have not come to destroy the law, but to perfect the law. And our Lord could only say that if the old law was not perfect. And here we see that it wasn't. And the reason why the old law was not perfect is because, let's face it, the people were so imperfect mm -hmm. that uh, if Moses had come down that mountain telling them, no divorce, it's all over now, stop that, they would have killed him. So rather than have Moses do it, our Lord himself, God himself, would come from heaven and he would tell us, <clears throat> this is now what I demand of you. This is the new law. Mm -hmm. And he would brave the consequences. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, there were things in the Old Testament that God <clears throat> tolerated because they were the result of sin. <clears throat> but he didn't condone them, and they were going to be reformed. But they actually were, uh, the law was made perfect with the coming of Christ. That's the new law. And how, how typical is this father of man to <clears throat> kind of just, just ruin everything? You know, all of these problems that, that we hear in the the Old Testament of, of um, even all, all these discussions of polygamy and uh, fornication and divorce and all of this, it's all a result of man ruining God's ideal for marriage. He created them in the Garden of Eden uh, to, to be one husband and, and one wife and for the wife to be a helpmate. And he had this perfect ideal of marriage set in place and it was man that ruined it. And because he did that and didn't follow God's law, now we have all of these problems of these divorce and, and all of these other things. And so, so many people like to say, you know, bring all this up and, and try, kind of try, try and criticize God and say, why did you, you know, there was all these problems going on with all of these things and it's all your fault. When in reality, if they would just consider the fact that God created marriage to be to be mm -hmm. perfect, his ideal of marriage was perfect, mm -hmm. but it was mankind that perverted it, and since he perverted it, you now have all of these Well, problems. it's absolutely true. I mean, we human beings want to take the blessings that God has given us and twist everything to serve our selfish purposes rather than his purposes. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then, you know, our own selfishness then turns around and blames God for it, you know. It's as though we say, God, why did, why did you do this? And God might say, well, <clears throat> uh, actually, you did this by your free will. Mm -hmm. And then we'd say, well, why did you give me free will? I'll blame you for that then. But if God were to say, well, do you want me to take away your free will? We'd say, don't you dare. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're perverse. I mean, we're, we're really, as you say, Tom, we, we mess up everything that God made, including ourselves. Yeah, and, That's and, where the real mess is. You know, Father, this, this trend so, shows no signs of stopping because now it's, we have with... Uh, 
with even the Marriage Act itself as being perverted, uh, where we now, as a result of the perversion of this, that we now have all this epidemic of STDs and, and AIDS and all of that. And this is just a continuation of that trend of abusing God's gifts. And when that happens, we'll have results like this. We'll have nature rebelling against us. Well, we think we're going to use our technology to defeat, to defeat the safeguards within nature. And in a sense, by doing so, to defeat God. Uh, even to defeat the decree of death because of sin, original sin. We think we're going to somehow grant, gain immortality for ourselves. And you know what? Really, the closer we come to that, I mean, we're never going to get to immortality, of course. But the longer we extend uh, life, the, just the more sinful the lives will get. You know, because they get prouder and more uh, defiant against God. <clears throat> so, um, we, we, I mean, you're right, Tom. We, we just uh, make it worse and worse and worse as long as we continue in our, uh, in our arrogant, arrogant pursuit of our will, right? oh, as opposed to God's will. All right. Well, next email, Father. Uh, here that says, if you look at the Eucharistic prayers currently being used in the Novus Ordo, is it possible to ascertain the validity and or illicitness of the current Novus Ordo Mass? Are all of the current Eucharistic prayers equally problematic? Is transubstantiation happening? Transubstantiation? Transubstantiation, yeah, is it happening? Uh, well, you know, the very least anyone could say at this point, I think, is that it is doubtful that transubstantiation is taking place. And I would even go so far as to say, I hope it is not taking place. And uh, some people might say, you hope the Novus Ordo is invalid? I'd say, yes, I hope it is invalid. Why? Well, because if it's invalid, it's just bread and wine they're throwing around up there, handing out, spilling all over the place, uh, dumping down the, the drains of the Sacraria sink in the, in the sacristy. If it's just glorified bread, blessed bread and blessed wine, then uh, it's not necessarily a sacrilege. Um, but if that is the, the actual living body and blood of Christ that, that they are abusing up there, it is the worst possible sacrilege, akin to Satan worship, the way they abuse what we, you and I, well, at a, a traditional Catholic service, would be the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. um, we see what they do, the carelessness, the disregard, and we see them handing the host to people who are manifestly, um, well, I, 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 I hesitate to say even what, what they're doing with the host up there because it is so scandalous that if we have any children watching, I, I, would, I would be very scandalizing. It is so grotesque what they're doing with their wafers in the Nova Sordo. So I hope this is not the body of Christ that they are abusing so terribly. Mm -hmm. Um... But back to the theology of it, there, there is certainly a, a, a doubt, an objective doubt about the validity of the Novus Ordo right as it is. I mean, uh, it is a, essentially a lie. They have, they have altered, they've, they've um, mutilated the words of consecration. Well, where, where do you even start with that? Uh, start with the validity of the priest who is even saying the liturgy. Look at the change there. I mean, that's the first sacrament they changed wholesale. And uh, one might say, well, look at the words for the ordination of the priest in the new rite. They're pretty much the same as what Pope Pius XII decreed in the Decree Sacramentum Ordinis in 1947. Uh, Pope Pius XII used his supreme apostolic authority and invoked the <clears throat> holy uh, uh, authority of St. Peter and St. Paul <clears throat> in issuing this motu proprio sacramentum mortis in 1947. And he states clearly, <clears throat> this is the matter, this is the form for the ordination, ordination of a deacon, for the ordination of a priest. This is the matter, this is the form that is required for validity. He says, necessary and required for validity. This is, the, this is what must be said, this is the matter, this is what is necessary for the consecration of a bishop. Okay? They changed them all. Okay? But one might argue, well, look at the Novus Ordo essential words in Latin for the ordination of a priest. One might say, well, they're pretty close, you know. In fact, one could argue 
the only thing they changed really was in, in Latin grammar the case of a noun or a pronoun, right? So, I mean, what possible difference could that make? Well, it's funny to think about that. That's actually a good question. There's actually a very interesting answer to that. In Latin, when you use the word in with the accusative, it has a very definite meaning of into. It's something that you're actually doing within a person. And when you change that from the accusative case to the ablative case, in and the ablative does not mean that. It has more the sense of like doing something about a person or around a person, but it doesn't convey the idea of actually de delivering something directly into a person or anything else. It doesn't have that sense of entering into that sense of motion. Does that matter? When you're talking about the priesthood, it does. <clears throat> because of the difference between a Catholic, the Catholic priesthood and the Protestant ministry. <clears throat> when I talk about ordaining a Catholic priest, I'm talking about doing something that actually imprints a character on that priest's soul so that no matter what becomes of him in eternity, he's going to have the mark of that priesthood on his soul even if he goes to hell. And so that is actually making a dramatic change within that person. Now, if I want to do away with that, and I want to convey rather the notion, uh, and I want to s s put this into words, that I regard this as no more than a Protestant minister, I'm just going to put a robe on him, that he can easily take off, he can get in the pulpit, get a job at a church, then go off and become an elevator operator at the Hyatt Regency Hotel somewhere, and, and that's his new vocation. He can just put on the ministry. He's deputed by the people. He doesn't represent Christ. He represents the people now as a Protestant minister. Then I would use in with the ablative to indicate that I'm just kind of putting this on top of him. I'm just sort of putting it on him like, like a robe. But it doesn't really affect him and who he is and make him anything, anything other than what he really is unto himself. You understand what I'm saying here? So actually, yeah, they know what they're doing. They knew the difference between in with the ablative and in with the accusative. I mean, every first-year Latin student knows that, whether he wants to or not. He knows that. <clears throat> so they made the, that change deliberately. And you know what? <clears throat> Within so many years after Vatican II, 40,000 priests left the priesthood. And the reason most given, they didn't know what a priest was anymore. That's no accident time. So, I mean, even the question of whether the man who comes to your table in your church now to celebrate the memorial of, of a memorial service, right? The memorial of the Lord as they first defined their new mass. You don't know if he's a Catholic, if he has the power of the priesthood or not. You have no way of knowing he's a priest because of that, because of the change in that right. Then you, you, you keep going. I mean, you, they changed the, um, the right of consecrating bishops and that is entirely changed now, the necessary form from what Pope Pius XII decreed. And uh, they put, in any case, that certainly would raise a question as to what they're getting at, what they're intending, what, the, what the, their notion of a, of a bishop is in the, in the Novus Ordo, what the modernist notion of a bishop is for them. Is it actually compatible with the traditional Catholic understanding of who a bishop is and what he does. Um, so the bishop has to be validly consecrated a bishop before he can validly ordain a priest. Both of those rights have to be valid without any doubt. Okay? Then by the time they get to their table, not the altar, they have the Novus Ordo liturgy itself, of the, of the Novus Ordo Mise, uh, to to deal with as to whether those words of well they don't call them words of consecration anymore you look them up in the general instruction on the Roman Missal it came out as kind of a user's manual with the new mass I mean here you have it laid out there exactly what this new mass really is and if you want to see what the new mass really is you don't even look at the general instruction of the Roman Missal that came out later because they did amend it because of serious flaws. 
They didn't amend the new mass, they amended the, the instruction manual. But the new mass, uh, the, the first general instruction that came out with the first edition of the new mass in uh, chapter 2, number 7, was the, the Lord's Supper, or Mass, is the gathering together of the people of God under the presidency of a priest to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. Therefore, the words of Christ are particularly true in a local assembly where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. But our Lord isn't talking there about his actually sacramental presence in the Holy Eucharist. He's talking about a spiritual presence there. But they're reducing it to that. And in that first definition of their new mass, that's what they said it was. It was a memorial service only. Um, the priest was presiding. He was the president, okay? I'm sorry, that's not what the priesthood is. He's not just a presider. That's a Protestant minister. There was such a hue and cry about that that they actually went back and changed it. But guess what? They changed the definition, but the thing stayed what it was. They didn't change the new mass. They didn't fix it. It still remained the memorial service. Only that. Even though they changed the definition to make it sound more Catholic. It didn't change the new mass itself. So when we read the, these... Uh, this general instruction that is the official commentary of what the new mass was we read not about words of consecration we read about we read about a narrative of institution is what they called it the story of christ at the last supper that's what they're saying they're telling a story that's what a narrative is right the narrative of institution and time and all throughout the new mass, they go back and forth between body and blood, bread and wine, body and blood, bread and wine, body and blood, bread and wine. They're constantly going back and forth between the two. So you can decide if you're a good Lutheran or a modern Catholic, whether you believe it's really the presence of Christ or just bread and wine that symbolizes his body and blood. After all, Francis already said, they believe as the Lutherans do in terms of justification and salvation. So why not that too? In other words, the question is, is a very complicated question. But no matter how simple an answer you give or how complex the, an, answer, an answer may be, it all points in the, in the same direction. It's very doubtful. <clears throat> and uh, that it is valid. And that in many ways it would be much, I won't say better, because better is a comparison of good, better, best. But this is not that. This is a matter of bad, worse, and worst. So I would say, if it is, in, if it is invalid, it is very bad. If it is valid, it is much worse. Mm -hmm. Father, a little bit of background. I'm actually glad you asked. This, this, uh, <laughs> this, this, this is a newer viewer that, that we received this email from. Uh, um, I've been watching your program since late December when recent events sent me searching for more answers. I have a, a uh, related question here. Um, can you comment on the distinction between validity and licitness and their application to the Novus Ordo? Is the new mass valid but not licit, or is it not either? Is it not valid nor licit? The new mass is certainly illicit, and in that it violates all of, the, all of the traditional decrees about the mass, all of the rules, all of the laws, all of the statements of the church about the mass. It violates them all. And uh, so it is certainly illicit, illegal in terms of the traditional Catholic faith. There's no doubt about it. It has been condemned legally by the traditional Catholic Church for yes, centuries. The elements of the new mass have all been uh, dealt with, addressed, and condemned. Um, and, and again, the, the validity is, the, the very least you can say about it is that it is doubtful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you take the new rite of baptism, um, if it is followed exactly as it is on the books, okay, and you have not only the matter and the form, the pouring of the water over the body of, let's say, the child, or the person that's being baptized, and you have the statement of the words in the Novus Ordo baptismal rite is, uh, whoever I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. They add the word Amen to the traditional form. 
it wasn't there in the traditional form because baptism was the beginning, not the end. And amen is, um, well, you can talk about that for a while, and I'm not going to talk about that. In any case, uh, the point is, if the, the one doing the baptism has the, has the necessary intention, that, that would be valid, right? But even there, the question comes in about the freelancers, so the, the, the priests and the deacons who think, oh, I can make this much more relevant by introducing my own uh, little twist to the ceremony. And that's where we've got to be very careful. And we, we have to inquire, you know, about the baptisms of those who come from the Novus Ordo, just to be sure it's too important to just leave it to chance. And uh, to leave it up to the local Novus Ordo deacon, whether he had the necessary intention. Hey, no, we've actually seen videotapes of baptisms of babies in which the Novus Ordo deacon actually stands up in front of the people ahead of time and says, we used to believe in, in uh, original sin. We don't believe in that stuff anymore. We're just welcoming, welcoming little Stanley here as a member of the community now. Totally invalid. He has an intention contrary to the intention of the church. So um, one has to be one has to be willing to make inquiries there and examine what the Novus Ordo does. You cannot trust them to do it right because they do not have the same understanding of the sacraments, and that different understanding is embedded right in the ceremonies themselves. In this uh, the Novus the Novus Ordo Mass, it's like death by a thousand cuts, even apart from the war narrative of institution which they've put in place of the words of consecration. I mean, I mentioned this before. Look at their offertory. Compare it to, to the traditional offertory of the Roman Rite in Latin or in English. Compare these two things. They do not say the same thing. Not at all do they say the same thing. What's the difference? The traditional offertory rite of the Mass says we are offering this sacrifice in reparation for sin for the priest, all those present, all the living and even all the deceased who are faithful Christians. We're offering in reparation. What sacrifice is that? That is the sacrifice of Christ. The Novus Ordo does not refer to itself as a sacrifice of reparation. It refers to itself as a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. The Council of Trent said in the 1500s, if anyone should say that the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, anathema. He's, off, he's cut off from the church. He's excommunicated. But if you look at the Novus Ordo, that's all it says. It says, it doesn't say this is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, but it only says it is a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. That's all it says. It does not say it's a sacrifice of reparation anywhere. And uh, that essentially removes it from being identified with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Uh, look, as I say, going back to the offertory, the new offertory, again, has eliminated the reference to this being a sacrifice and reparation for sin. It's not there. They have one statement at the end, okay, that could conceivably be interpreted that way, but you'd have to, you'd have to do some just gymnastics to try to make it say that. <clears throat> so, um, you know, in answer to the question, as far as um, validity, they have so mutilated the sacraments, and actually the very concept of what a sacrament is. And I think you'd, you'd have to just admit there's an objective doubt regarding the validity of, um, for example, their, their new masses and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, a number of their other sacraments, too. Yeah. Hey, by the way, look at their marriages, right? Look at Francis. He even says most of their marriages... The vast majority of their marriages are invalid, done by their own priests. I mean, that, should, that, that kind of answers it. your question there. Yeah. He doesn't even know what to do about it either. And, and <laughs> when he was asked by a priest, what do we do about it? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. My hero. <clears throat> uh, well, Father, we, <laughs> That's what popes are for, right? We've, uh, we've, oh, my. We've got a few minutes left, Father, and I, I wanted to mention real quick, you know, yesterday was the feast day of, of St. Francis de Sales, a great, mm -hmm. great saint in the church, and he was a, certainly a, a giant in the, the spiritual life. And uh, I thought one of my one of my favorite quotes of his, if I could just read here, and, and he's he's talking of the uh, 
the sanctification of man and his perfection and what that consists of. And he says that some place it in austerity, others in giving to charity, others in frequenting the sacraments, others in prayer. But for my part, I know no other perfection than loving God with all one's heart. Without this love, all the virtues are only a heap of stones. Father, could you, in just a couple minutes, give us some kind of description of what this, what a life of perfect love for our Lord would look like and how, can, how we can obtain, attain to that? Probably not. <laughs> you know why? Because, first of all, my answering a question in two minutes or less is practically uh, <laughs> metaphysically impossible. Okay. But also, I mean, when you talk about a vast topic like that, I mean, Father Gary de Grange wrote beautiful and beautifully elicited. St. Francis de Sales, Treatise on the Love of God. He, he didn't have two minutes or 45 <laughs> words or less to talk about this. But if you want to look at what perfect love for God is, and you look at the Blessed Mother's life. Look at the life of the great saints. They were striving for that perfect love of God. And in true wisdom to not only conform their, their, their wills to God's will, but to, to actually seek a uniformity of their will. So there's absolutely no hint of opposition between their will and the will of God. That was achieved in our Blessed Mother's life. So that is why, you know, she's held up, held up by the church as, a, as an ideal, the Mary Immaculate, you know, uh, conceived without original sin and never did the slightest sin uh, attack her soul or besmirch her soul, as it were, um, stain her soul because Never was there a rebellion in her will against the will of God. Temptations, yes, yeah, temptations. Um, and some, well, obviously, you know, her, the death of our Lord, her son, who she loved so unspeakably. You know, she loved with all her heart and soul, mind and strength. I mean, that's how she loved him, as her God. And, and she wholeheartedly accepted that because it was the, the will of God. You know, we talked not long ago about the, the fact that when the Blessed Mother in St. Joseph found the child Jesus in the temple after three days of anxiety looking for him, <clears throat> that they did not understand what our Lord said to them when he answered, I must, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And some people regard that as almost... Uh, raising the question of whether Our Lady really knew what Our Lord was there to do. Did she not know that he was there to do his father's business? Did she not know what Christ himself, her son, had come to do? Uh, she did know. She did know very well. One commentator said she just didn't know exactly how it would be done. But, you know, in, in that particular question, we have to step back for a minute. We have to realize something. And it's what comes immediately afterwards. And that is, the Gospel tells us that after this incident happened, our Lord went back to Nazareth with them. Went, it said, down to, Naz to Galilee and down to Nazareth. And um, that he was subject to them. And then it says, he grew in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. And so I think we need to remember, if the Son of God himself could grow in wisdom and age and grace before God and men, then why would we be surprised that the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph would be learning, would be learning and also growing in a deeper and deeper understanding of what they might not have understood in this particular case, but they grew to understand. <clears throat> um, certainly, Yes, obviously they could, and they did. <coughs> it's not as though our Blessed Mother uh, had everything mapped out for all the decisions she would have to make, ever make in the beginning, so there was some kind of a, an automaton or a, some kind of robot who was just kind of following a script. She had real decisions to make, and uh, they had a real impact on her, and, and there was a great deal of suffering involved in this for her. But she herself had times when it was not given to her at that moment to understand fully the significance of what was happening there. But her, her uniformity with the will of God was such that she didn't need to know. And that shows her sanctity more than anything. She didn't need God to explain himself to her as she went along so that she could say, oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm okay with it now. She didn't need that. 
because her will was absolutely uniform. All she needed to know was that it was God's will, and she didn't ask further. She was willing to wait in God's good time to understand uh, what what her, her role and what her obligation was in the practical order. Um, did she know when she went to the wedding feast of Cana later on in life, 18 years later, that they were going to run out of wine and she was going to ask our Lord to work a miracle there? When they went to the marriage feast, I don't think that the Blessed Mother you know, had sent ahead for word how much wine they had and how many guests they had and what was the likelihood of running out of wine. No, no. But she was responding to a grace at that moment to know what to do. But that was the occasion. And, uh, and she responded to it, and uh, the result was that the Blessed Mother was the one who actually made the call for her son to be about his father's business at that moment. She was actually answering what was done 18 years before when our Lord said, I must be about my father's business. She is the one who, who actually asked him to begin the road to Calvary uh, through his public life. So um, if we're going to look... Did I, did I talk for more than two minutes? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, if we're going to look at, at a living, breathing example of perfect love for God, we really have to go to our Blessed Mother. Mm-hmm. St. Francis de Sales would tell you the same thing, but he would have said it in two minutes and le- or less and much better than I did. Yeah. Uh, Father, you know, we have a, a, a super moon out there tonight, and as I was, as right. I, I was, I was driving home this evening, it kind of uh, came up over over the horizon as I was going up a hill and it's just uh, breathtaking to, to see the, the super moon out there and you know how the the, the moon is often used as the, some kind of metaphor to give us an idea of the the glory of the of the Blessed Virgin Mary and I, I had this this thought Father you know how um, in, in sacred scripture and in the lives of the saints we read over and over again about uh, and the, the the angels various interactions with man how man is always exceedingly afraid when the angel uh, when the, an angel will appear to him and it, it seems that there's many cases where the angel's first words is do not be or do not be afraid mm-hmm. and and you know and uh, I believe Saint Thomas says that it's only the lowest choirs of the angels that that come to earth and mm-hmm. and deal with man and you know if, if man is so so terribly afraid so amazed so impressed by one of these lowest of the angels, can you imagine it, 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 when in, in heaven the, the vast choirs and choirs of angels? You know, I've, I've read that some theologians say that uh, that the lowest choir of angels, the, the the simple angels, that the number of angels in that choir will be ten times the amount of all the human beings that have ever lived on Earth. This is a, a rough estimate, and if we run that math now, you know, there's some rough estimates that say there's somewhere around 100 million or 100 billion human beings that have lived up to this point. So if we assume that's fairly accurate, that times 10 will tell us that there's somewhere around 1 trillion of these angels in the lowest choir. And the choir above that will have 10 times, so 10 trillion, 100 trillion, all the way up. And if you, you know, you think of just one of these lowest of the angels has this amazing power of a man just to render him just dumbfounded. Well, some have had such visions and thought that they were having a vision of God. And it's, the angel had to tell him, I'm a creature like you said. Yeah, and it's, and it's one, one angel, one of the mm-hmm. lowest. And if you, I mean, it's absolutely incomprehensible. To, there, there's these, these trillions and quadrillions, quintillions uh, mm-hmm. of angels and even higher higher degrees, multiple degrees higher than these lowest of the angels. You think of the cherubim and the seraphim and all of that's just absolutely incomprehensible. And you think of all of that and how great and how amazing that is. And then you have the queen of the angels who absolutely dwarfs all, all of these mm-hmm. all, of, all of these vast, vast multitudes of, of angels. They are in admiration of her. Yeah, I think that, that's <laughs> all just of them. a... Um, that's astounding. A, uh, yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing thought. Wonderful to think about. Yeah. Definitely. And you know, really, the key to understanding our Catholic faith is the Catholic Church's teaching on heaven. Everything has to be understood in the light of that, because that is the goal, everlasting life. And I think that's a lot of prob- a big problem that a lot of Protestants have. They don't understand the Catholic teaching on heaven. And if they did, they would see how everything makes perfect sense in light of that. But Protestants don't really have necessarily an understanding that, obviously, the Catholics 
have and the Catholic faith has of what heaven, what everlasting life really is. Um, but the vision that you just described here uh, is very well said, Todd, or eloquently said, and uh, powerfully said. And um, if people could uh, think about that, ponder that, meditate on that, and get that, that, that kind of in our minds as we, as we pray the fourth and the fifth glorious mysteries of the Rosary, the Assumption of Our Lady and her glorification in heaven as the Queen of Angels and the Queen of Saints, um, we would see that as a consummation of our faith. And why we, why we have the closeness to the saints that we do, why we realize that they are so close to us, because they are united us, to us to the, 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 the mind and the will of Almighty God himself, and what they contemplate in the mind of God. Um, well, then hopefully... Uh, you know, people could aspire to that everlasting life that our Lord is calling them to and realize the emptiness, the absolute vacuousness of the things of earth and never be falling into, into, into this trap of materialism. Mm -hmm. and they realize the glory that the soul is called to, to share with the angels. And uh, so, it's time to invoke our Blessed Mother, right, and ask her for her prayers. I think so. I think that's a beautiful place to end, Father. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, you're very welcome, Tom. Yep. Thank you. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima, to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.